Jose Green Vision Resource Team is a partnership between the Air District and the City of San Jose and is one of nine Spare the Air teams in the Greater Bay Area. This program is also brought to you in collaboration with Actera, Sustainable Silicon Valley, and 511 Rideshare. I have Philip Kobernick, Sustainability Project Manager for the County of Alameda County General Services Agency with me here today. Philip is a member of the Southern Alameda County Spare the Air Resource Team. The Commute Champions program was Philip's idea. He launched his Clean Commute Champions program two years ago and it's been wildly successful. Also with me here is Laura Zachensky, Associate Transportation Specialist, Transportation Options Program for the City of San Jose's Department of Transportation. Laura is a member of the San Jose Green Vision Resource Team. Last year, the team, to last year, the team chose two new projects inspired by Philip's work, the Green Commute Champions Program and the Green Commute Challenge for City Employees. This year, the team's new project is to help promote Commute Champions programs and get them started in the city at large. This webinar is an outreach effort to that end. We'll now hear from Philip and then Laura. Following their presentations, we'll have some time for Q&A and end at 11.30. The webinar is being recorded and you'll notice a chat button to ask questions in the far left-hand corner. It looks like a rectangle um, dialog box. Okay, Philip, you're up. Okay. Thanks, Mari. That was a very nice introduction. Let me go uh, swap out the slides here. Okay. Give it a second for the internet to do its thing, and everybody should be seeing my slides coming up. Great. Okay. Um, thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to be talking about... Um, the Alameda County's commuter program, that, um, what we're working on here, uh, some strategies for employee engagement around clean commuting, um, and some community-based social marketing tips that, um, that we're doing here. Um, but as always, I, I'd love to hear how people are implementing these programs at their agencies. So I'm really looking forward to uh, the Q&A at the end, too, to hear kind of what's going on um, across the Bay Area. So real quick, a background on Alameda County. Uh, we're a pretty large organization. We have almost 10,000 employees. And a challenge for us in terms of our commuter program is that we don't have one central campus that employees are coming to. We have nearly 200 offices uh, spread around the county from Berkeley to Fremont to Dublin. And so you can imagine um, the sort of washing machine effect that has on, on commuting, people coming and going all over the place. Um, so there's no one strategy really that works for everybody. And then finally, the last challenge is that there is one and a half people dedicated to running sort of our commute program here at Alameda County. I consider myself the 0.5, and I've been fortunate to have amazing fellows and sustainability interns working on this program with me. Um, but if you're probably in a similar situation where you don't have a lot of uh, staff power to put into these kinds of programs. So uh, another unique challenge that we have here in Alameda County that some of the large employers may be sharing is that we have an incredibly diverse workforce um, in terms of the jobs that people are doing here at Alameda County. So we have firefighters um, that have 24-hour shifts, very different kinds of commute behavior and work schedules and other folks. We have uh, folks that work for environmental health, um, highly mobile, they're in the field all day, and social services agency, uh, another organization that's very spread out in the field doing a lot of work with the community. Um, very different commute needs, schedule needs, and very different office cultures as you may imagine. So we are spending a lot of time on commuting um, because if you've done a greenhouse gas inventory analysis for your organization, especially if you're a large organization, it may look something like this. You know, your own buildings will be a big part of it. Um, the electricity that you use, if you have cars that you use regularly for your operations, uh, it could look something like this. And employee commuting is probably a pretty substantial part of your greenhouse gas impact. When we do our analyses, we show that it's actually the largest single impact that we have. So if you're a large organization with a lot of folks driving in, um, it's, it's probably up there. For us, we're at about a two-thirds drive alone rate. So if your organization's hovering around there, then you're probably having a pretty substantial impact from your commute operations. 
So it's obviously a big global impact. Um, I like to reiterate the local impact that commuting has here in the Bay Area. We're now in the summertime and spare the air days are going to be coming. Um, we've already had a couple this year for summer spare the air days. And there really is a strong local impact when it comes from emissions, from transportation. Um, obviously, traffic is not getting any better. Um, criteria emissions are causing real big problems um, in a lot of Bay Area residents, especially the young and the elderly. And there's a big environmental justice issue too. If you look at maps, um, which is the top left picture is here, it's a map of um, incidents of asthma and then also transportation corridors and people of uh, low income and uh, communities of color. And there's a really strong overlap there. So there's a big environmental justice issue with, um, with emissions that I like to, I like to address. So that's where we come in with our program. Um, we provide a lot of tools and resources for our network of our employees to get as many people as we can to get out of solo driving and into um, into clean modes. Uh, so we provide secure parking for bike our uh, bike commuters. Um, we have some shuttles, uh, not sort of the luxury liners that pick people up in their neighborhoods, but the, we have a few shuttles that connect people from BART um, BART stations to county offices that are not walkable. Um, we do a lot in terms of free parking for our commuters. Um, we do carpool matching. We're kicking off a new van uh, program. And we, you know, obviously work with and promote a lot of our partners here in the Bay Area, like Guaranteed Ride Home, 511, all these kinds of programs. And then a lot of employee engagement, which is what I'm going to be focusing on today. So the goal of our program is to take 12, 1,200 drivers off the road by the end of 2017, which will be a 20% reduction in our uh, driver loan rates. So enough about that. Um, I'm going to focus on employee engagement. Um, it's really important to be utilizing your employees and then um, and then having employee engagement be a central strategy to a commuter program. Um, it's it's really not enough to have just bike to work day um, or just walk to work day or like one thing per year. Uh, it really needs to be an integrated uh, part of your operations. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so. Uh, we started a Clean Commute Champs program. Um, I'm going to be diving into this, and we kind of took a couple different approaches here. So the first step was we wanted to decentralize our outreach. Um, like I mentioned before, we have 200 different offices, very different kinds of cultures, very different kinds of needs, very unique local barriers. An office that is right next to BART is obviously completely different than a BART, uh, an office that's five miles away from BART and there's no bike lanes. So we needed to decentralize our outreach um, in order to meet people where they were at. Uh, we wanted to recruit allies with local knowledge. How do things work in your office, uh, for instance? How do you know what are the things that are going on? Maybe you have a different culture or different things that are going on that, that we have no idea about. And we wanted to use uh, utilize community-based social marketing. So the way we started um, is we targeted uh, the deep greens, uh, and this these are employees that are. Every office has them. I'm sure when I say this, you're thinking of the guy who bikes 30 miles to work or um, the woman down the hall who filled her van with seven employees to carpool to work with. The people that really care about their clean commute and doing it the right way, um, those are the people that you want to start with. And so we recruited them in our biannual commuter survey. We asked a question at the end uh, that kind of asked, you know, do you want to get involved in helping the county be more sustainable by you know, helping us with our program? And we got hundreds of employees that were like, yeah, that's that sounds great. Let's let's do it. And so we targeted them and then provided them some training. So the goal um, of our champs program, or a few goals, were one: these employees, after they are trained, they are going to be a local resource for their peers. Um, so we wanted, you know, if you're a brand new employee and you've got questions on you know, taking transit for the first time, you should get those questions answered as quickly as possible and ideally by someone you know in your department. You don't want to have to find me, one of 10,000 employees, to get your question answered. You should really get it by people that are in your office that can help you uh, and can tell you about local things like where to park your bike around here. So it's to help employees be a local resource for their peers, answering questions, funneling them back to um, me and my program when, um, when they can't answer those questions, and then also to empower employees as ambassadors. We give them a lot of tools. I, here are some pictures of some of the pamphlets that we gave. So these are new employee pamphlets on taking new commutes. Um, but we really we wanted to we wanted to recruit uh, and expand our program by using employees as our ambassadors. So it's our sneaky way of taking 1.5 staff and then you know expanding it to over 100. 
So we did provide them a training to get started. Um, so we've ride at lunch and we did several rounds of these now where we had about 20 to 30 people in each one. We provided them a two hour training um, on how to be a clean commute champ. So here's a slide from what that training looks like. We obviously, we gave them a crash course on Bay Area Transit because um, it is a little confusing um, if you've never done it before. And then some of these folks are really dedicated bike commuters but don't know how clipper cards work, for instance. Uh, they don't know about maybe like auto load features or or um, commuter benefits that can help you save money on commuting. So we gave them a crash course on that to really well round them and be able to answer questions on a wide range of topics. Uh, and then we also focus on real people. Um, so you'll see the who, why, how can I help? So that was, here's a person in your agency who's already doing this. Use a real example so people, it's not a hypothetical thing. There are real people that are doing this and you should try it too. Uh, why is it important? And then how can you help your colleagues uh, switch to some of these different types of commute modes? Okay, so here's a little screen grab um, of sort of what the training is. So. We really we, we did skits. Uh, it was kind of fun. Uh, we have people reenact these types of situations um, where one person plays the role of a new employee. They're like, "Oh man, I've been thinking about carpooling, but um, I don't know. I don't. I, I don't. I'm worried about giving up my freedom, or I have to pick my kids up at childcare, or I'm worried about being late to things." And so we sort of we've trained our clean commute champs to pick up on those lines, and we've given them some lines that have tested well with focus groups with employees and have just have tested well. In terms of messaging. So for instance, we refer to Guaranteed Ride Home as free insurance for your commute, and we frame it as a benefit. Uh, and then it, you know, there's a lot more head nods, there's a lot more acknowledgement for people to try it when they hear it framed that way. So we frame our pre-tax commuter benefits as an opportunity to give yourself a raise. So when somebody addresses questions or concerns about the cost of transit, like it was a great opportunity to give yourself a raise through our HR's commuter benefits program. And we reenact it, and that's always the most fun of these trainings. Um, so I'm going to go into a few community-based social marketing tools here um, that we use in our program, um, and I think they're uh, good tools to, to use. Um, if you haven't heard of community-based social marketing, it's a really fantastic uh, way to target behavior change from a marketing point of view. So you know you can't really say um, just try transit because there's a lot of barriers that go into that decision. There you really need to address those and then use these uh, CBSM tools uh, to get people to try to try decisions. So I'm going to talk about a couple of those tools. So one is social norming. Um, social norming is essentially the um, innate ability in humans to want to do what other people are doing. We're sort of from a psychological point of view, herd animals essentially. And you know, if you're walking down the street and you see four people looking up into the sky, there's some driver in you that makes you want to look up and see what's coming too. And so you want to sort of see, you want to do what other people are doing. And social norming is, is a way to do that. So commuting is an invisible behavior. It happens before and after work. And so find opportunities to make that more visible. So the way we do that is we feature our employees all the time in our newsletters, in our countywide communications. Um, we have pictures of people showing that, you know, this is something that happens every day. Um, I've seen examples where people will put in their lobby, like, here's all the people that clean commute in this building. Uh, just kind of reiterating that this is part of our culture and this is something that a lot of people are doing. <laughs> We do it with our champs, and we've given them a whole bunch of visibility materials for people to find them, um, so they know if you're a new employee that you know that there's a champ around, and you can ask them some questions about your commute. And it's all it's also an opportunity to norm the behavior. So we provide these little flyers, which are you know they fill out their name and where their office is, and they put them in a break room or something like that, uh, so people can find them. Giant posters for your door. Some people don't have doors; they have cubicles, so we give them these little flags so people can find them. Uh, and if they don't want a giant one for the door, there's a little bit more modest one that they can hang up in their wall too. It all kind of contributes to, to that norming effect. Social diffusion is another really great tool. Um, so social diffusion uh, is sort of the concept that people uh, mostly get information not from the news, but from people that they know and respect. Um, so you learn behaviors, you get your information from from your peers. Uh, and that's how most people learn things. Uh, and so we want to use that. That's essentially what the champs are doing is you're, you're, you're going to someone you know and getting the information from them. Um, so this is another training that we did in our Clean Commutes Champ training where people are practicing how to communicate uh, and, and work with their their peers to try to convince them to try a different style of commute, or do one of the steps to lead up to 
uh, trying a different commute, like ordering your Clipper card, um, getting started on that. Another fun one is public commitments. Um, you're much more likely to make a behavior change if uh, you have made a commitment to someone who's not yourself. Um, so like a great example of this is when, um, like if you're RSVPing at a restaurant, sometimes the host will ask you, you know, can we count on you to make this time or can we count on you to call back um, if you're not going to make that. So if you're making a commitment to someone else, you're more likely to do that. And we've played around with that in our program where we've had people, you know, commit to trying something on a different day or commit to taking one of these steps by a certain time. And we're letting them like, we, we're going to follow up with you to make sure that you did this. Uh, and so you post those commitments publicly. And so we did one where people committed in these little leaves and they put them in the lobby um, to make it more public. Um, so that's always a fun way of doing that. Um, I'm also gonna talk about gamification real quick. So gamification um, is the use of game thinking and game mechanics in a non-game-like setting as a way to engage people and just kind of make something a little bit more fun. Um, so think of um, so th think of like um, like badges you would get as a Boy Scout or something like that. That's sort of a, an idea of gamification that you're working. Uh, to get these achievements or badges, they're progressive, so you you keep stepping up in levels, and you know these, these are these are all over the place, um, and lots of different like games and apps and things like that. So we use them here. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, um, but we use this. We made a big online game for um, a community commute day, which was like it was a campaign that we did in the in the spring, to get people to go through steps that they would take to start a clean commute. So. Uh, when would you want to use this in, in your programs? You want to use this when the motivation is low, but barriers are also low. Um, so you want to get excitement around something, but no one's going to play a game to, you know, um, do like a real, like a radical change. Like if they're 10 miles from BART, they're not going to start taking BART all of a sudden because you got them to start playing a game. But they may sign up for a carpool matching service. Like the barrier to signing up for a carpool matching service is much lower than figuring out how to traverse 10 miles of backcountry roads to get to BART. So you want to use it when motivation is low and the barriers are also low. And tying it with teams and public commitments is a really good way to get people to do that. So I'm going to spend my last uh, eight minutes talking about Community Commutes Day, um, and which was a big campaign that we did in the spring, just to kind of show how some of these were done in practice by us recently. So we had a few goals for this. Um, we wanted to obviously encourage drive alone commuters to switch. That's always the goal. But we also wanted to show how many clean commuters already exist in our, um, in our network of employees, which is contributing to the norming part of it. We wanted to tackle some of the perceived barriers around clean commuting, because a lot of those are out there, and use champs to address local issues at offices across the county. And then finally, we really wanted to build behavior uh, behavior changes one step at a time. This wasn't a campaign that was just going to say, all right, guys, let's all now try a new commute. Um, we wanted to build those behaviors. So this is how we did it. So this is a screen grab of the game that we made. And ultimately, I think we had about like 800 people playing this online game. You'll see on the right, these are some of the teams and the number of, of people that were in those teams. So these had like 57, 93 players in some of these teams. And they all, the champs mostly started these teams and kind of came up with fun names, like the Soaring Eastmont Eagles. Their office was in Eastmont. Um, but really, the, the point here is that we had, we wanted to get people to build these these changes one step at a time. So the first thing I did was pick a, plug, a public pledge that they're really going to commit to trying something new on Community Commutes Day. Let's start by enrolling in Guaranteed Ride Home. That's a great benefit to start off with. When we do our commuter surveys, we ask a question that says, like, what are the tools and resources that would help you the most or give you the most confidence in using a clean commute? And people constantly say Guaranteed Ride Home. And a lot of people don't know about it. So we really promoted that as step two to starting your clean commute. Joining a school pool, um, that's a big thing for parents with young children, is I can't clean commute because I have kids. So we organized school pools to, to promote that. So really addressing the steps that lead you up to that, that switch. But we did a lot around Guaranteed Ride Home, um, too. We did a webinar on that. We did a whole thing on how to order a Clipper card, um, all, those, all those steps. For norming, um, these are two of our clean commute champs, uh, both awesome, awesome employees, and uh, they agreed to allow us to, 
uh, to cartoonify them. Um, so we took a few of our employees with quotes, um, and these were all over the county, showing that you know real employees are, are, are choosing the clean commute. They're um, biking with their kids. We really wanted to target um, parents of the young kids in this campaign too, um, feeling less stressed because they're using the HOV lane. Uh, but it's doable. Real employees are doing it. So we did that. Um, we featured those around the county. This was our man. This is a real fun part <laughs> of our community commute day. So we built this cardboard stand-in and we wanted people to try on a clean commute so uh, and then we would give them points for taking photos in it so we have dozens of these really fun photos of employees putting their faces in these little cardboard cutouts to try on a clean commute just like another way to subconsciously help them visualize the fact that they can be in a carpool um, but it was just a, a great photo opportunity for us and um, we have a lot of opportunities for people to join in. Um, so we featured clean commutes. We featured employees that were doing it. On the left, you'll see that um, we we have a few shuttles that we run from BART, and we fill them with balloons. And um, you know, they, we had a little sticker on them that says, I took the county shuttle today. So people would take those from the shuttle, and they'd pop up all, all at our county offices, and they would submit photos of themselves to kind of show, like, yeah, I took the shuttle. Um, this is a group of our some of our employees out at our jail in Santa Rita uh, that are in one of our buses saying that they all carpooled to work that day. So we're featuring these as much as we possibly can. Um, and then the role of our clean commute champs in this campaign was really our local organizers. So here's three, um, well, there's three groups, but they all have champs in them. Um, the uh, woman on the right dressed up as um, a Little Red Rider Hood um, to kind of be funny and, and promote BART writing at her office. Um, they were instrumental, and in, we couldn't do a promotion like this across 10,000 employees without substantially getting a lot of employee buy-in and a lot of help from our employees. So they started teams um, at their local offices. They recruited their peers. Um, they were putting up flyers and slides, giving presentations, um, rallying their folks to really get involved and, and keep going. They facilitated fun events. Um, like one of our Clean Commute Champs organized a conga line from BART to their office on Community Commutes Day, which was amazing. Um, and you know they gave a lot of great feedback to us on things that are working, things that weren't working in their offices, and really helped push it along. So they were essential. So a quick overview here, some of the benefits of a program like this are peer-to-peer -peer information sharing. I can't emphasize it enough. Um, people will learn from their peers as opposed to one person just kind of putting out emails. It's a great way to engage people throughout the year, not just through emails. Um, it provides me on the ground information, like if an employee, like if an, an office is moving or they're changing something, it's a great opportunity to come in there. So they give me information on that. It empowers employees to express their values at work, which is just another great way to get people involved. You know, if someone cares about sustainability, but they don't have the opportunity to do that in their jobs, great way to get more people involved and recruit volunteers. So, you know, you can't have 100 staff in your program, but you can get 100 volunteers to help you promote it. And it's relatively inexpensive. We didn't spend a lot of money on these campaigns. So some of the challenges is you do need year-round engagement. You can't just do this once a year and have them drop off the face of the earth for another year. So there needs to be things that are kind of keeping their interest and letting them know they're appreciated year-round. Um, but you also don't want to burn them out. You know, we're not doing campaigns every two months. We do spur, like we do them kind of spread out throughout the year, one big one, and then we check in with them throughout the year. But we don't ask too much of them throughout the year. It does take some upfront training time. You want to make sure that uh, your employee volunteers are recruit or you know, they're you recruit them and then give them the tools that they need. So there is that upfront time. And the last point that I kind of want to make here is um, if you're running a commuter program or a sustainability program for your um, your organization and you have internal cars that you use and there's a fleet manager, go say hi to your fleet manager and make friends with them. Um, or if you're using Zipcar or City Car Share for your employees to get around, that's a huge barrier. Uh, people need to get around for their job. And it was something that I didn't really get the grasp of until I came on here. So within GSA, what we've done is we've combined motor vehicles, parking, and our clean commute program all into one large team um, that, that really helps us manage um, that all together because these are all really related and so one example of that we get from employees is I need to drive my car for my job no way that I could possibly take BART I've got to go out and, and visit 
you know, I have to do home visits. I have to do court visits. I have to, I'm, I'm mobile. I have to go out and do my job in the field. So that's why we're working to get our vehicles online like Zipcar. So if you have a contract with Zipcar, City Car Share, uh, that's an essential thing to promote for work, obviously, but also as part of your commuter program. Okay, and then for more on community-based social marketing, great website, cbsm.com. Definitely check that out. Um, we have an annual sustainability report that I'm happy to uh, selfishly promote here. And that's it for me. So with that, Laura, I'm going to queue you up here. I'm going to unmute you first, mute myself, and then I'm going to pass you controls. Okay, Laura, you are unmuted. Can you hear me now? Sure can. And Thanks. your slides should be popping up. Yes, they have. Great. Okay, so with that, we're going to hand it off to you. Thanks, Philip. That was a great presentation. Makes me realize how much more I still have to learn from you and your program. I'm Laura Tachinsky. I um, manage the city's San Jose's Green Commute Champions Program and our challenge program. And I will tell you up front, we have copied as much as we could from Philip. He's done a great job and is a great model. Um, my slides aren't advancing, Philip. Um, I can just go, I can go ahead and, and whoop. Did it? Can you advance for me? Sure. Can oh, you here, try? Maybe here. Ah, I found the place to do it. Okay. Perfect. Um, I wanted to provide some context for why we started this program, and that's um, largely um, due to the fact the city of San Jose adopted some very ambitious mode shift goals when it adopted its most recent general plan in 2011. So we have the goal of being able to uh, have our drive alone rate from 80% in 2010, actually 77.8% 70, to be more exact, to 40% by 2040. And we want to increase the percentage of folks who are using transit, biking, walking, and carpooling from a collective 16% up to 60%. So you can see it's, it is very ambitious. Um, and we also wanted a 40% reduction in VMT and vehicle miles traveled. We have some challenges in realizing that, although we are trying to be as strategic as possible to make that happen. And there are a lot of uh, physical improvements that are being made by the city and by our transit agencies that does make it somewhat easier. And we do now have services like carpooling and bike share and, and bike share and car share that we didn't have five or six years ago. Uh, but it's still the city is very sp sprawling. Um, and also our employees are pretty spread out. We have about 6,000 employees and about a third of them are in City Hall in the downtown core, but all the rest are spread out at community centers and senior centers and libraries and work yards, similar to what um, uh, Philip was describing in Alameda County. Oh, one other thing I didn't mention is that the city has a philosophy if we're going to be trying to get our community to do something like reduce waste or reduce the amount of water that we use. We also want to lead by example at home. So the city has supported our efforts to try to encourage more employees to also try to reduce their drive alone rate. Um, we recruited, we, excuse me, we launched our Green Commute program and the challenge in 2015, as um, Mari said, through the partnership we have with the Air District and it's in our San Jose Green Vision Resource Team. And the team is continuing to support our development of our CHAMPS program. Uh, like Philip, we recruited from our, our green team folks around the city um, and other folks we knew who are avid supporters of biking and transit use. And we were able to recruit 27 CHAMPS from the very beginning and that represented, those people represented 17 of our 21 departments. So we had a pretty wide spread, uh, although uh, most of the, the largest bulk of our champs came from two departments, our Department of Transportation, which I'm in, and also the, our Environmental Services Department. And the other departments were fairly thinly represented. So that was one thing we realized at the beginning is we were going to need to to deepen our contacts in the other departments. Our city council adopted a proclamation kicking off our Green Commute Challenge. And our challenge was a way of, of being able to engage the, the champs very very early on with a, with a major effort using the gamification concept. Some people do like, it does motivate some folks to be able to get out of their cars if they have some competition that they're participating in. And 
to be fair, some people also get turned off by challenges. Uh, we did train our, our um, employee volunteers, the champs. We were not able to do longer than a lunch hour because all these folks are doing it over doing it on their volunteer time, on their own personal time, and so we scheduled trainings and squeezed them into an hour. We had two sessions to make it possible for more people to attend. And like Philip, we followed up with the idea of being able to put posters and other kind of things in the, our workplaces so that folks could find their champs. So we had a, a poster like this with the names filled in on the bottom for every department break room um, for our champs. This is a simple outline of the training um, session content will be covered. As I mentioned, the mode shift leadership goals, we did talk to our champs about their serving as ambassadors and peer educators to their colleagues. But like Philip pointed out, we were, we were relying on these people's passion about what they are doing, whether it's transit or cycling or walking or whatever it is that they're doing to work, to share that enthusiasm with others. And the training, again, like Philip's training, was trying just to, to uh, fill in the places that they weren't as familiar with. And we also wanted to collaborate with them to grow the program because we knew that they knew their, their work sites and colleagues and the culture in those different departments better and, and subsections of departments better than we would. So uh, we have worked in partnership very closely as we've started to develop this program. We had a resource panel with, with folks who talked about the different um, transport, transportation options that are available in the city and also our employee commute program. And we have enhanced our program also with the guaranteed ride home and the pre-tax benefits um, lately, and not everybody is still familiar with those, so we were telling them more about the options that employees have. And then we engaged them in a conversation about what they thought the best ways were that they could use to encourage participation and what did they think they needed from us to be successful. Um, I mentioned the challenge. We started it in uh, May of 2015, and we thought we'd do a four-month uh, challenge each month with a different theme. Um, people could count any trip that they took, and it didn't matter the theme, but the, the workshops or the information we were presenting each month was slightly different. We had folks log their trips on the 511.org site, and that proved very challenging just because it's, it's hard if you're not used to that system to be able to figure out how to log your trips. We were using it in a way that it wasn't really designed originally for, in terms of pulling the data out, the things that we were our, our championship was based on were not the same as what is logged in that system. And uh, the champions were a real help in just helping their colleagues learn how to um, figure out how to log their trips um, and encouraging them to continue logging their trips over the four-month period. We also hold, held a number of workshops and uh, events, walks primarily, to help people try things that maybe they hadn't done in a long time, like bicycling. So we had workshops on how to get back on your bike, how to bike in an urban and neighborhood safely, uh, some tips for biking around San Jose. We had a panel on shared mobility options that included car sharing and uh, bike, bike pools and carpools. Um, we had a downtown public art walking tour. We had several walking tours and we had a couple on art, a couple on trees. Um, and we also had a workshop on transit options. Our transit agency came in and talked about how to use their system and how to use their trip planning tool and what improvements were going to be coming online fairly soon. We tried to stay away from incentives. There's also a, um, pretty commonly used incentives, but a lot of the social science research says that it's not very useful for a behavior change that you want to make. It's an ongoing behavior. But we did include uh, kind of fun trophies. We created a big and small green shoe. This is the baby shoe. We divided our departments into uh, small and large, less than 100 employees, more than 100 employees. The smaller departments got the small green shoe. Every month, the shoe moved uh, between departments, and the large departments got the big shoe. Uh, we also had an SAP. We had, the city has a, a box, the SAP Center here, and we, we gave that as the trophy for the large department and small department at the, at the end of the of the um, first year challenge. We had 182 participants, so low, given a base of 5,000 employees, but they were spread across the city, and we did increase the number of champs that participated. Um, as Philip said, that you can't do it once a year and expect it to be a large change, and so we knew we wanted to not only retain the champs we had, but we wanted to keep them engaged 
um, and recruit more champs over the course of the year. We had been meeting on a quarterly basis. I mean, we did start to decide to meet on a quarterly basis. And a large part of what we were talking about was what worked and what didn't work about the challenge. Um, they gave us a number of suggested some improvements, and then we came back to them with ideas about how to address those issues, um, which are listed in some of these. Some of the changes, the most obvious ones, were listed here. We shortened the challenge period. Four months was just two months, particularly when you're trying to get folks to log their trips manually. That we could see the drop off in the logging toward the end of the challenge. So now we're just we're trying out one week for three months. So for during the months of May, uh, June, May, June, and July. One week out of each of those months is a challenge period. And we expanded the number of eligible trips. We did run an employee commute survey, uh, employee survey of commuting during this period of time, and we shared the results with our champs. And what we found was two of the things that, that Philip mentioned, that a lot of folks who were using the car felt they had to use it for work, and also that parents felt it was very hard to use, to use the commute. Um, to participate in the commute trips. Um, and also some folks said that they worked at a lot of sites where there just was not very good commute transit service. So we decided to expand the el eligible trips since our goals as a city is to c reduce drive along trips that are commute and non-commute. And so we invited folks if, you t if they took a, a utilitarian trip, a trip that would otherwise have been taken by a car rather than exercise. They took that kind of a trip after hours, during the lunch hour, and on the weekends could count that toward the challenge. And we simplified the trip tracking system. We created our own system. Our IT director created uh, our own tracking system, still manual. We had hoped to go to an automated system, but we couldn't quite get there. And the champs were part of testing, field testing that, and giving us improvements. And they were really pleased with it at the end. So they also were telling their colleagues, it's try it this year. It's a lot better. And then we had a number of events during this period of time between the challenges. We provided information, things like winter cycling tips that came up from the champs. There was a hunger for that kind of information. We had a more lunchtime walks. And we also were promoting other events that were consistent with what we were doing. The employee benefits fair where we talk, employees learn about their employee commute benefits as well. And then we had our first Viva Calle open streets event in San Jose. In 2016, we implemented the changes that we had described, I described, that we had come up with with the champs. And we also increased our use of community-based social marketing strategies. Uh, we did a lot of visible commitments. You can see in the far right of the, of the uh, slide, there's a picture of folks who had signed a commute and then stuck it on their cube, the outside of their cube, so others could see it. Um, we increased participant visibility also by providing stickers to our champs, which our champs then provided to their colleagues. When they knew somebody had bicycle or used transit or had walked to work, they would give them stickers. They could put on their cube, they could wear on, on their clothing, and some people like to wear them. But after a while, you started to see these stickers showing up everywhere in, in the floor, which was nice because even when the challenge wasn't going on, people could see that there are a lot of folks who were using these alternative means of commuting. And we also profiled some respected leaders in the city's internal newsletter. Uh, and it was important that they be not just leaders in the city, but people who people broadly respected. Um, and these are people who are also doing alternative commutes, I might add. And we tried to build the internal capacity of the teams. We met with the departmental teams. Now, some of them were four-person teams or two-person teams. Others were 15 people. Well, you tried to meet with each of the department's teams to try to help them figure out what their strengths and weaknesses were, what they needed to do to recruit more folks from their department. If they found units that didn't have champions, if they helped them brainstorm how to reach out to them, help them brainstorm different strategies they could use to engage more folks. Um, we were we did the lunchtime outings um, in order to help help them also recruit more folks in their department. So it became a social outing. Come take the bus with us. We're going to meet all um, meet at City Hall at the the uh, light poles, the flag poles. At a certain time, we're going to get on this bus. We're going to go to this location, and there's a number of restaurants there that are further than most people will go for lunch. So it's a different different place to go, and it can be a show social outing for folks to do in their in their teams. And then we decided to increase the number of meeting times. This is at the CHAMP suggestion. So we were meeting monthly to do strategy sessions. Um, one of our, we also, our CHAMPs were also sending out email messages to the colleagues, if not their department, then they would do it to smaller teams. And one of them included this message in their, their um, 
message to their colleagues. And it's this kind of thing that you can, you know, they can do because they have their relationships. We, we would never, from our department, send out a message template that would have language like this, but we thought it was kind of funny. Currently, we, um, we are still have one more month of the cha challenge. Actually, in two weeks will be our final week. Uh, but to date, we already have doubled the number of participants in the challenge, and we broadened the number of departments that are participating, which is great. For example, last year, our fire department and police department had absolutely no participants. We're slowly making some inroads in those departments, and we know that there are folks who use transit regularly who weren't participating, so we're trying to make them more visible as well. Um, and we've increased the number of champs and, more importantly, have deepened the, the bench on each of those departments that were, were engaged previously. Um, we're having a recognition event in late July, uh, again, on a suggestion of the champs. Um, last time when we only recognized the two departments, we got out information about who, who won, but we never got a chance for everybody to celebrate their participation. So this time we're going to be doing that. And with the idea of norming behavior, we're creating a huge montage of photographs that we're going to be hanging out in the uh, downstairs lobby of City Hall. Where, where, again, a large number of the people and the public come through to see, they'll see, and we'll also take it out to the event in the um, plaza where we're having the recognition event so those who are coming from other sites will get a chance to see it. Um, our next steps in, in particular is to try to expand beyond the downtown. It's much easier for folks to use alternatives, particularly during the day events that we're organizing from the downtown, but for the folks who live in other, depart other areas of the city, that's much more challenging and we need to figure out ways to make this work for them as well. And we need to increase and maintain the participation level both in the challenge and also in the CHAMPS program and find ways of counting the folks who just don't like to, to be part of championships. And that's it for me. Thank you so much, Philip and Laura. I'm super excited about the Champions program, and it's great to hear from two cases, one which is two years in maturity, Philip's program, and then Laura, the city of San Jose, um, San Jose Green Vision Resource Team's um, one-year program. I know we have two employers on the line that are just beginning their collaboration with the state of the art team, so this will be their first year in the Champions program. So let's um, zero in on a question starting with the beginning. Um, but before I do that, I want to remind you, I'll ask a few questions. But everyone online, if you look at your screen, in the far left corner, there's a little bubble and a, um, OK, I'm getting a message that it's hard to hear me. Um, switch mics. Switch mics? OK. Thank you, Philip. I just got a message that it was hard to hear me, so let me just uh, say again that um, we're super excited to um, be hearing from both Laura and Philip today. And I want to remind you that the um, you can ask questions now in the far left-hand corner. There's a little bubble that looks like a dialog bubble, so you can start typing in your questions there. And let's just get started, because I know that we have a couple employers online that are just beginning their collaboration with the Spare the Air teams. So starting with Philip, um, what advice would you have for a TDM professional who's just getting started on um, starting a CHAMPS program? Um, definitely start by uh, getting your baseline done. If you haven't done a commuter survey yet, uh, you need to start that as soon as possible. Um, you know, you can't fix a problem if you don't know how to measure it. So start by doing a commuter survey. Um, absolutely. Um, and then in that survey, see if you can recruit some volunteers. Um, you want this group to be self-selecting anyway. So you um, you want to give people the opportunity to raise their hand and say, yeah, I, I want to help. I want to I want to help um, our company become more sustainable. You know, uh, sign me up. So I would say that that's a great step. And then in terms of like programs to get started, um, there's a new law in the in the Bay Area through um, this new state law that requires you to have some uh, and some different kinds of implementations of a commuter program up, up and running already. The easiest one to do is your pre-tax commuter benefits. Uh, this for, so for large employers, that's you know that's a great one to get started. Great, thank you, Philip. Um, Laura, how about you? What was your advice for uh, someone just getting started with a commute champions program? Um, you know, I'm thinking 
the the things that, that Philip just said are absolutely very useful and beyond that um, there were things that we did we identified leaders in the community that, that people respected who already were doing um, alternative commuting and we could publicize what they were doing to others kind of like what Philip had done with uh, the colleagues the people who are champs I think the more people who get who see their colleagues doing something um, is really encouraging for them to think that well maybe I could do it too then or they know someone that they could turn to for, for information and actually the the um, the team very supported our ability to be able to create a logo and to be able to put information out uh, like the poster about who you can go to in your department who's a champ and the uh, we're also putting up pennants like Phillips flags to help people be identified because I think when they someone sees someone in their department who's already doing something if they've got the inkling to even find out more information it's someone who's close but they don't have to make a phone call they can just stop by that person just and ask them questions thank you I see we have a pro did you switch Yep. I uh, see we have a question coming in from Ellen Barton. What was the budget for the project year um, in either of your locations? I'm going to hand this to Philip first. Uh, roughly, what did you spend per participant? Um, so champs are pretty cheap. Um, we, I mean, on, on like those shiny posters and things, I think we spent a, a couple hundred bucks. Um, and then, you know, for lunch, uh, that, that that's that's pretty negligible for community commute stay um, our overall budget um, I'm, I'm failing to remember a specific number right now but it was definitely under three thousand and that included um, designers to do our logo um, to create those cardboard stand-ins to get those printed to create the website um, we used an online firm called playlife um, they spell life with a y so P-L-A-Y-L-Y-F-E. Um, they created that online gamification portal for us. Um, all the outreach materials and the balloons and all that stuff. Um, it wasn't much. Um, so that would be a couple bucks per participant. Um, in general, um, we, we, you know, our program is funded uh, mainly through, um, we, we charge drivers to park at a lot of our garages, and that what, that's what funds a lot of our program. Um, but uh, in terms of tools and, and resources that we do, um, this is certainly one of the least expensive part of our overall oper like tools and options portfolios that we have for our employees, and I think is one of the most bang for our buck in terms of investment. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Laura, would you like to answer? Sure. We really didn't have a budget for this program. It was just staff time that we were doing by the seat of our pants trying to figure out how to be effective. We did have a website, internal website, already built, and so I was able to ask colleagues to help me with creating uh, pages on our website to provide more information about our employee commute program. But really, the, the support came through the resource team. Um, they allocated us $2,000 which allowed us to do things like create a, um, a logo and print posters and um, create the pennants. And we did provide some lunches because our budgets internally we couldn't use for lunches for champs. And they would have come also, but it was really nice for us to be able to thank them to come here. Some are coming from a remote sites, so they would have lost their time for eating lunch to be able to just come here and be fed a simple, simple meal. I know that they appreciated that. Um, other things. Uh, one of the things we were able to use a different budget for was to build to pay for the, the stickers, which cost a little bit more. Maybe there was three hundred dollars. But each of these items, like Phil said, is in the two hundred, three hundred range here for for this and that. And so altogether, we spent less than two thousand dollars this year. Okay. Thank you, Laura. We have a question coming in. Do you involve any third-party services such as bike sharing, ride sharing, for the program, Philip? Yeah, we, we definitely do. Um, for bike sharing, I mean, I can't wait for the Bay Area Bike Share to come to the East Bay. Right now, there are, they're in San Francisco and the peninsula, kind of that Caltrain corridor, San Jose. Um, they will be coming soon, I think next year or so, um, to, the, to the East Bay. So very excited for that. We'll definitely collaborate with them and promote that to employees when that happens. Um, ride sharing. Oh, yeah. So absolutely we do. Um, we're using Ride Amigos um, to do our internal carpool matching for our employees. Um, they're creating an online tool for us to sort of integrate 
uh, ride matching, rideshare matching, carpool matching um, into like a Google searches type application. So um, I'm going to be focusing a lot on onboarding um, in the next year and getting our champs kind of to be integrated with that HR process when a new employees come, point them to this tool for them to plan their new route and then find uh, people to to carpool with while you're doing that. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Philip, I'm going to ask you this question coming in. Do you have any recommendation for a construction company on incentivizing employees to transition from the traditional F-150 truck mentality to more fuel efficient vehicles? Um, Right, so that's uh, that's a fleet question. So that's actually the other half of my job is dealing with vehicles and fleets and things like that. Um, I don't have a recommendation for specific construction companies. No, uh, we don't. I mean, when we contract out um, work like that, we don't get that involved to tell them which vehicles to use for their work. Although for our internal fleet in Alameda County, we got about, we have about 1,100 cars in our vehicle fleet. Um, I know cities and other counties around the Bay Area are, has similar numbers. Some have a lot more. Uh, we're doing a lot in terms of our fleet and transitioning our vehicles to be more efficient. Um, our, we're doing a lot of electric vehicle charging stations and things like that. So internally, when we have departments that are trying to buy trucks like F-150, our fleet manager is very involved in making sure that they're getting the right vehicle for the right job and they're not getting too much car for something that they don't really need but that's for things that we have control over it's a lot harder i'd be very curious if you're if you've built that into your contracts or with external um you know orgs or contractors that you're working with i, I would certainly be curious to see that we have a lot more control over our own vehicles versus others Thank you, Philip. Um, we have a question. Have you tried to get the commute champs recruitment training time counted towards their work duties, much like the emergency response team members do? It seems like it's a top priority for organizations, and then this should be beyond their lunch hour volunteering. I'm going to um, have both uh, Philip and Laura answer this question and just pipe in myself that um, one of the beauties of this program being volunteer is that you really get the people who want to be there and are engaged and passionate. But um, perhaps you've both tried this other approach as well. Let's start with Laura. No, I have. It's an interesting idea. I and mean, we could certainly check that out. Uh, I had even thought about trying to approach it because these folks don't have their their prime job is not related, but it's a good model to think about as a parallel. Great. Um, well, I'll start by saying that our board has been very supportive of our internal sustainability programs and initiatives here at Alameda County. Um, they've really been champions of, of pushing us to, to do more in terms of sustainability and working with our employees on that. So uh, I actually, I, I use the word volunteers a little bit lightly. Um, employees are allowed to do this. Um, in, integrated with their job. I mean, they have to get the okay from their supervisors when they're going to spend some time on something, obviously, to make sure that they're in the loop on these types of things. But we don't require them to use vacation time or anything like that. This is sustainability. Our clean commuting is an integrated um, program here in Alameda County. So employees can work on things as part of their work duties for these programs as long as they get the okay. So we've been sort of fortunate in that way that we've hadn't had to deal with um, with that so much, it's it's generally been given the nod of approval here, and not in, in addition to commuting stuff, there's other internal teams and things like that working on sustainability that really works with employees here at, um, in in Alameda County, and some people spend you know some time working on getting new programs up and running and, and promoting those out too. So we've been fortunate in that way. Thank you, Philip. We're almost at time here, so I want to take a minute to thank um, thank Laura and Philip for sharing their programs. This has been really a great opportunity. On the behalf of the San Jose Green Vision Resource Team, I'd also like to thank our collaborators, Actera, Sustainable Silicon Valley, and 511 Rideshare, and to all of you who attended the session today. Um, you can see the slide that says contact information, and um, please do contact us if um, contact me if you're interested in starting a Commute Champions program. As I said in the uh, introduction, that the San Jose Green Vision Resource Team 
um, their new project this year is to take this out to the community in San Jose. And a couple of the other teams have uh, CHAMPS pro programs as well with, that they're promoting to help get started in companies. So you can um, see my contact information there, Mari Pierman, um, and email address, so just shoot me an email. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a great day.